supposed to um, involve all the speakers, in fact, all the participants. So uh, I know that there were people who were very eager to ask questions and who were cut off. So um, uh, maybe someone could raise their hands. So I guess, Alberto, you raised your hand. You want to start out? Yes, thank you. So I have a question uh, for uh, um, uh, people working on uh, non-local quantum gravity. So the question is, in a non-local quantum gravity, which is renormalizable, uh, is the propagator of the graviton always falling faster than one over p squared in the UV, or uh, uh, there are other possibilities? I know it's a very technical question, but sorry. It's related to the uh, Callan Lema representation and stuff like this. Is anybody. There is Gianluca. Gianluca, I think, raised this hand. Well, I, I, yeah. I'm not doing those models, but uh, there are several different possibilities. They can have propagators that fall off exponentially. They could also have propagators that are just ordinary propagators and have uh, exponential convergence factors in the uh, Euclidean exponential convergence factors in the vertices, both kinds of models. I, I've seen both kinds of models and I've seen people put them together. And they are both, they can be both renormalizable. Uh, indeed, finite. These uh -huh. sort of models were originally proposed uh, way, 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 way back before any of us were born, uh, before people understood how to do renormalization. Uh, they were proposed uh, as an attempt to uh, try and uh, deal with ultraviolet divergence. And indeed, you know, if you put in a factor of e to the minus p squared in Euclidean space, uh, loop corrections will converge like a bat out of hell. So how there is this? A few uh, other little problems, but but convergence will work. So how is this compatible with, uh, let's say, uh, the fact, uh, at least in regular field theory, which are local, that uh, um, in quantum field theory, all possible terms uh, are obligatory. I mean, if you consider specific form factors. Uh, how is it possible that other form factors are not generated by quantum corrections if you include, for example, a viable theory with all matter fields that you need to describe I don't know, the standard model plus dark matter, et cetera? I mean, uh, at the end, uh, is it possible to have a theory of everything, let's say, which is renormalizable with specific form factors? Uh, and why? I mean, well, you seem to be taking from what I'm saying that these are okay theories. These are not okay theories. At least I, I don't think they're okay theories. Uh, terrible, so terribly bad Cauchy problems. They're, um, they're typically, uh, typically they have the metric, uh, the uh, flat space metric play a special role or one particular background uh, metric play a special role because uh, you can't, when you put in these factors of e to the minus Euclidean momentum squared, obviously, you know, if you're dealing with a gauge theory, uh, that's not a gauge invariant quantity, right? Um, you could make it be the gauge invariant covariant derivative, but that turns out not to be finite. Uh, and uh, so it really does have to be the derivative in one particular background. Uh, the theory can still be made gauge invariant. Uh, it's a weird non-local gauge invariance. It's one of the few things that we learned from string field theory is how to do this. Uh, but, you know, these are, I would say, very problematic uh, theories. Uh, however, if you're just concerned about ultraviolet divergences and, and convergence of uh, loop integrals in Euclidean momentum space, you can get that. So I think uh, John Duke, I want to say something about this. Um, yeah, going back to your question, did, uh, were you referring to Velandau Paul when you asked the question? Did you have a Velandau Paul in mind? Well, Landau Pauls are one aspect, but yeah. But uh, even without considering Landau Pauls, even just speaking about renormalizability, 
so I'm a little bit puzzled by the fact that uh, people working on this uh, scenario are putting some specific form factors. Okay, so they're not putting the most general or local theory. So how well, is, as, as, as how is it possible? Uh, so maybe it's possible. Eh? I just wanted to understand. How is it possible that other terms that are allowed by the symmetries are not generated uh, in this scenario because you're putting some specific form factors and we are used to the fact that in quantum field theory all terms that are compatible with the symmetries eventually get generated so i just wanted to understand this but uh, mm. uh, well on one hand uh, as 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 richard said that didn't say um, when you consider the most possible general form factors it's true that uh, in general you get uh, all possible type of troubles so uh, restricting mm -hmm. to restricting to some um, classes to some families of form factors uh, at least uh, uh, give us the possibility to answer to some questions now uh, what are the symmetries that we are talking about uh, in general for for, for no local quantum gravity um, except uh, proposal like uh, proposals, uh, uh, well, no, I'm, we're talking about no local quantum gravity. Yes, in general, there um, uh, deformorphism invariance at the classical level is a, is a, is a, is a preserved, and uh, you, you yeah, just uh, yeah. consider uh, yeah. covariance yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, and the different variance. So, yeah, but, um, uh, Dan, does not restrict. Uh, um, um, I actually have done higher loop calculations in non-local field theories. Uh, and again, I, I wanna stress that I don't believe that these are fundamental theories. What typically happens if you, uh, if you do them like, uh, I think it was Hushalev, uh, it was one of our speakers uh, set up. He used a, a technique that I worked on way back in 1992. Uh, if you, if you use that technique, what you're going to get from loop amplitudes uh, uh, can actually be read off from uh, dimensional regularization. So if you take the dimensionally regulated uh, answer, loop amplitudes will have a divergent gamma function, typically a gamma function that looks like gamma of one or two or something minus D over two, right, at one loop order, uh, and corresponding gamma functions at higher loop orders. What happens in these techniques is that um, that uh, gamma function that you would have gotten in dimensional regularization gets changed uh, to being an incomplete gamma function of uh, certain momenta divided by the mass scale. So uh, it's now, and then you set D equal to four. So it doesn't diverge. Uh, it's a completely finite thing and a predictable thing. So in answer to your question about what new stuff happens from loop corrections, that it's known, you know, within that, uh, within the context of that <clears throat> particular kind of um, non-localization, what kind of new stuff you're going to get, you're going to get incomplete gamma functions of, uh, of the momenta. Uh, I, I think I also comment on the gauge issue that uh, uh, Gianluca was mentioning as well. Uh, again, another thing that's known is that that uh, you uh, um, these factors of e to the minus e squared or e to the anything, you know, uh, some some entire function of e squared are, from my perspective, on a fundamental level, hugely problematic. Uh, some people who don't actually check loop calculations think, oh, well, I'll just take the covariant derivative and then it'll all be gauge covariance and generally coordinate invariant. You could do that and it would have the property of being gauge invariant and generally coordinate invariant. It won't be finite, however. You might be thinking, well, how can that not be? You know, if you've got these exponential factors. Well, indeed, you've got them compared with the local stuff that you had in the original Lagrangian. But if you look up in the exponent, You've got terms up in the exponent, which are just local functions of the fields to make it a covariant derivative. And those things will give rise to divergences. So if you really want it to be finite, you have to have it be uh, you know, just C number factors of e to the minus p squared, not the, uh, the dynamical variable. Uh, and 
that of course then raises huge issues about gauge invariants. Uh, there is a way to, um, to not preserve local gauge invariants, but to preserve a sort of a non-local gauge invariance, which is a deformed, non-locally deformed version of gauge invariance. Uh, and it's an interesting story. It's a fascinating thing. And I think they make very good regularizations, very interesting regularizations, physical regularizations uh, of, of gauge theories. Uh, so, so if you don't like the automatic subtraction, the killing of, of power law divergences uh, that dimensional, that analytic regularizations like dimensional regularization and zeta function regularization will use, you can use these techniques and then you can see explicitly power law divergences. But to me, it's hugely problematic to have the flat space metric and also particular gauge backgrounds, whatever particular gauge background you choose appear in those differential operators. That to me is hugely problematic. I know people here don't agree, so, but that's my thing. You say that uh, it's not proved to be gauge invariant, this approach? Uh, it, it is proved to have a gauge invariance. It's not any longer local gauge invariance. It's a non-localized extension of gauge invariance. It's an interesting thing. This is actually what um, was Grigory Efimov's uh, old problem. He, he was motivated by these scalar models of non-locality, which could achieve completely finite things. He tried to do it for gauge theories and for years and years and years was frustrated by it. And nobody actually ever could figure out how to do it. Then came the string theory uh, development and string field theory taught us how to do it. Because of course, string field theory is talking about theories which are gauge varies, uh, talking of, uh, is representing theories which are gauge theories. And you can look and see how string theory achieves it. Uh, and the way that it achieves gauge invariance, string field theory does not have local gauge invariance. It has local gauge invariance at the free sector. But if you look at the interaction uh, it is not locally gauge invariant. It's a non-local gauge invariance. And uh, the types of models that I'm talking about have that thing. So they're fully gauge invariant. They have a kind of gauge invariance. It's not local gauge invariance. By the way, we never needed local gauge invariance. The reason that it came along was that we were restricting to local theories. What we need, the physical thing that we need is uh, positivity of the energy, unitarity, and decoupling. And the non-local gauge invariances that string theory has do that perfectly well on the perturbative level. And you can do, you can build that into field theory too, similar kinds of gauge invariances. Uh, again, this just, the, the problem for me is the special status that's being given to um, to the uh, to particular backgrounds in defining these differential operators, that to me is hugely problematic. Uh, another problematic thing I think that Ashok Sen mentioned uh, is that you will have bad behavior, uh, typically of amplitudes. Uh, so they'll the internal things will converge, the internal loop corrections will converge. But if you look at uh, you know amplitudes in the Mandelstam parameter plane, there typically will be some directions in which they grow. Uh, and, you know, obviously that has issues. Uh, but if you just want to make it finite, you can do that. Maybe someone wants to sort of comment on, on these challenges for uh, non-local terms. Oh, I want to say a comment, a small comment here. It was also discussed in the non-local session. So the thing is, like, if you define form factor, like, okay, with the... Uh, Ghost free and nice properties, renormalizability and everything, super renormalizability, everything. But uh, once you add matter, there is conformal anomaly, it destroys the structure of uh, ghost free structure of uh, form factors. So then you will get back the ghosts. I think this. Uh, what, Raman, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah. if the theory is finite, you don't have conformal anomaly. Well, I mean, that uh, removing anomaly. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's you need to extend. Well, the, the, I could speak to that again. I, I, I actually have worked on theories that had conformal anomalies, and you still will have conformal anomalies in finite theories, but they're okay. Uh, again, what you need is uh, is to have decoupling of the theory, and you can you can have theories which will have uh, decoupling. That's what you needed gauge invariance for. Yeah, but uh, I don't know if conformal anomaly can be 
easily removed uh, so i mean maybe in that uh, uh, additional con- scalar field uh, if you introduce make the whole lagrangian conformal invariant well i don't uh, really understand that approach but in general just the non local lagrangian well, why do you want to remove it uh, well I, I, if okay if it is not removed then once uh, you i mean fixing form factors actually does not make sense uh, because anyway anomaly destroys the um, structure of the form factors then we will get back the ghost i think that is an open problem well, what uh, no, no conformal yeah. anomalies are consistent with, with not having ghosts well uh, maybe no, no, i'm no, not no, understanding i, I don't this. know i'm uh, maybe maybe i should uh, put it in a different way look so we we, we write a non local lagrangian with some fixed form factors and say okay compute everything and say it is ghost free fine right then you and once you have some matter loop corrections then you have to add counter terms then this will destroy the additional assumed structure of form factors so that means basically it is inconsistent so that is what uh, shapiro was pointing uh, in the in the discussion session uh, we had so uh, i think uh, we i mean fixing form factors well, is well uh, look i i've uh, done uh, actual computations quite a lot of them in these techniques i i think i'm the only person who's done even a two loop calculation with these non local techniques and you will preserve gauge invariance a sort of gauge invariance and it will drive the thing that you physically need current conservation and decoupling uh and you still will have and everything will be finite but you still will have conformal anomalies so let's let's yeah, yeah, jump in that's what i'm that's like uh, yeah. yeah jump in cuz gia raised his hand yeah i had to i mean as an outsider um since i'm not working on this um, uh, on the non local uh, this type of non local theories but so my, my question is um and maybe some, someone can can answer this um and so so do you think that there so there can exist a, a realization of this uh, so called non local form factors uh, a consistent theory that on one hand would be consistent meaning probably i mean cost free etc and on the other hand would not be equivalent of the four factors that we get by integrating out infinite tower of uh infinite tower of particles so that would be my question do That's you think this is hmm? so i think it's a question to richard i i don't know yeah whoever can if it's someone can ask well, okay well look i i've built models i i can send you some references on it how so 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 i can build you more yeah, i'm not going to enter it <laughs> i'm not going to we'll do it uh, you can you can non localize there there's Sorry, a procedure that uh, gary kleppy and i invented way back in 1992 that's just a turn the crank procedure you give me a theory and we will tell you how to non localize it in such a way that you preserve the tree amplitudes and you change the loop amplitudes and you make them ultraviolet finite i I do not think that this is a good theory. I do not think that these are good fundamental theories, but and we just advanced it as a technique of regularization, just as a regularization technique, a physical regularization technique, but it will have the properties uh it it will uh, uh not have all the baggage of string theory. It will not have the infinite tower of states. If I so maybe, if I may ju- if I may jump in Uh, I think well, uh, actually Anupam let's there are other people who raise their hands so let's I know I want to answer Gia's question no, no but there are other people who want to answer Gia too so okay. sure sure Anna do you want to unmute yourself uh yes uh actually I had a question regarding the last discussion on uh, uh conformal anomalies divergences and so on I'm also from a bit uh, different community and uh, I'm not a specialist in quantum gravity computations uh but uh I uh, just want to know uh whether uh it's proven or can be proven uh, that or it's obvious maybe that uh divergences which uh, can appear in uh, non-local gravity theories uh the one loop divergences uh, which are the only divergences there as I understood Are they are local or not do they come with uh, some functions with form factor like um, f of box uh, with some combinations of uh, curvature invariance over epsilon or it's just uh, some 
uh, combinations of uh, uh, curvature invariance over epsilon. What is the situation? I can answer if you want. Please answer. Okay, so uh, uh, Anna, you can look our paper with uh, Lavrov uh, a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago. So it is basically the situation is the following. Uh, if even uh, up to some extent, if you have non-local theory of quantum gravity, uh, which is a power counting renormalizable, super renormalizable, then at one loop, you have only local divergences. But I would not say there is a, a well-proved theorem for that. So it's, but it's very, very strong argument. Okay. So it is, for divergences. Of course, non-local part will have this logarithmic form factors, uh, which uh, Javier Calmet mentioned yesterday. So, but uh, divergences will be local, I would say. But on the other hand, you can, in principle, create artificially theory, which will not be renormalizable, and then you may have non-local divergences. In principle, it is subtle issue to some extent. Okay? Well, for instance, if you have, for instance, if you have scalar field, and if you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, then it depends which variables you use for the background. So if uh, from if you put in terms of scalar field, it will be local. But in terms of gravity, if you go to, uh, if you look for, let's say, uh, symmetry violation, these things, you may have perfectly well non-local divergence. I can, I can give you references if you want. That would, okay. uh, that would be great. Thank you very much for the detailed answer. I, I, I dreamed uh, to get such kind of robust answer finally. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, so um, can we then claim that um, if we have only local divergences, if we manage to build such kind of theory with only local divergences, then uh, uh, it's completely fine and uh, no problem arise, uh, no problem with uh, uh, some. Uh, uh, in, uh, the, then with costs which can arise there is not uh, is not appearing no 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 I I, I, I think that if you uh, start from the theory as we discussed two days ago if you start from the theory which has no ghost at the tree level and if you don't uh, you you need some infinitely precise fine-tuning to avoid ghost so all type of type of loop corrections uh, make the theory uh, to have ghost-like states, but there are infinitely many, typically, where there are infinitely many ghost-like states with complex poles. And there are many open questions. For instance, uh, how to make calculations in this theory? We, a few years ago, we tried with Andrei Barvinsky, and Andrei wrote for me, I have still these uh, two uh, sheets of paper, when he wrote for me how these calculations can be done, it is completely non-trivial. Okay, in this non-local series, but I never put this into practice. I don't have uh, sufficiently strong students for that. Let's say. <laughs> okay, so so nobody know how to make. As far as I know, nobody know how to make calculations. This is the first question, and uh, conceptual question is what happens with decoupling in this series if you have infinitely many, uh, maybe very light, uh, complex poles. For sure, some of them will have real parts which will have very small uh, values. Okay, maybe some of them have real parts which will be positive, negative, or infinitely many of them. So what happens with an effective theory at low energies? This is a very interesting question. Nobody explored it. Okay. So the time is moving on. And so I suggest that we move on to a different topic. And uh, Ravan wanted to raise a different topic. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. So. I want to ask a, a question to Alexei Starobinsky and Gia Diwali. There was a discussion on uh, uh, black, black hole and microstates and uh, an analogy with cosmology. And uh, Alexei Starobinsky also mentioned in, in his talk, uh, there is no information problem in the context of cosmology. I really want to understand if they, maybe if you can elaborate and uh, it would be nice, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, sure. I, Alexei, you, you, you want, would, you, would you like to start or, or I can start? I don't know. Uh, you are muted, Alexei. Uh, please unmute, uh, Alexei. I, okay, I can give you my version of the, uh, of, of the answer. Oh, start, please, yes. It's okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, first of all, um, as, as you probably, um, as also from my talk, you, you saw, 
I, I mean, I, I don't think uh, there is any information uh, uh, problem in, in either for black holes or for the inflationary cosmology. So I don't think this, um, this is a problem. And actually, uh, for, again, I, I, I mean, sorry to be, be <laughs> Sorry to insist on S-metrics, but but that, that, that but but that, but that's the that's the fr that's the framework from which I I, I see that uh, uh, pre pre I mean pretty pretty precisely that uh, in both cases. Uh, so in, in case of black holes, there is no question because black hole uh, is a result is a reson from the point of S-metrics theory. Black hole is a resonance in an S-metrics process because we can a gravitational collapse. We can uh, very nicely understand an as, as, as an S-metrics process. So you form a resonance and then it decays. So from that point of view, a black hole is uh, a saturon, as I said, um, something, uh, let's say a Z boson. I can, I can, I can also do as matrix scattering, uh, produce a Z boson and then Z boson decays. Um, so black hole is technically a little bit more, I mean, a little bit more complicated, but it's, but it's not conceptually more complicated from the point of view of S-metrics theory. So it's again a unitary process. And uh, from the, again, from the S-metrics perspective, what I would say is that if, if we have inflation which obeys this uh, quantum breaking criteria so that the number of defaultings is, is not exceeding the, the, the quantum breaking point, then they are also every, everything looks, looks okay. So it's, it looks like it, it looks that uh, there is no there is no evidence. At least I don't see any evidence of any information uh, problem with the with the microstates of the inflationary Hubble patch. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, right. That would be my my answer. Okay, okay. So then I shall continue. Okay, I have uh, uh, I was a uh, very concrete statement, but just because you know interesting inflationary models we are at least in our past light cone the dual illustration of inflation was at finite when that we have no we have no problems uh, which is uh, um, which would be analogous to, to a case of a close of information in the black holes it just Concretely, we really uh, have a perturbation which goes out of the, of the Hubble of the Hubble radius of one observer, but that's why they have not disappeared. And actually, and actually, we even uh, saw them after the after the end of inflation. Once more, in this respect, I would uh, uh, just because I was in our, uh, speaking um, to younger participants, because they, in many in many places, they uh, may uh, find a misleading statement. The sitter has no hairs. Once more, it's really a misleading statement because, uh, as I said. Um, uh, uh, the sitter has no has inside the Hubble radius, but outside it has it has hairs, and a part a part of this hairs uh, uh, is just with is just with primordial perturbations, and and what's more, the, um, uh, I think the inst instructive analogy with the general relativity is just. Uh, that we have no hair theorem for outside black holes, but no such theorem inside inside black holes. Once more, but, uh, uh, sh shortly my answer is just b because you know realistic models inflation, the duration of inflation is finite. So, okay, so uh, we have no loss of information. And, uh, maybe, uh, I could, maybe I could add a little bit because I uh, so I so Alexei, you are you are, when you when you are saying when you are when you are mentioning uh, no hair theorems, uh, those no hair theorems are classical, and classical no hair theorem uh, is not maintained at the quantum level. At the quantum level, what we see in a, as an S, again as an S matrix approach, both black hole carries a quantum hair, which is one over n quantum hair. And also the sitter, I mean, inflationary Hubble patch, it also carries a quantum hair. So therefore, 
there is no contradiction with the classical no here theorem because when you take h bar going to zero limit, this here, here disappears. It becomes, you need infinite time to resolve it. The way continuity is recovered is that the, the hair means information. So information mean, needs a readout. So if I give you a book, but, the, but it requires infinite time for you to read this book, then it's the same as you get an empty book because they, that doesn't matter because you will never be able to get information out of it. So that's exactly how black hole works and how, how Hubble patch works. So at, classically, in H bar going to infinite limit, you would need infinite time to resolve this quantum information. That's why classically we don't see it. But quantum mechanically, the time is finite and it's given precisely by this quantum break time, both for a black hole and for, for, for inflation and Hubble patch. So there is okay. no contradiction with classical I think, yeah. I, I think on this issue, there's really no, no real disagreement between what you are okay. saying and I- Yeah, and there's, I, there's, I, there's a good like, uh, so you know, like someone to, uh, to add, and this will be in particular, this will, will be some intersection which will what uh, Professor Penrose said we are, Still, I, I prefer, I prefer to speak about absorbable, absorbable things. And actually, once more, without looking at the, at the, she, she, at the picture of she in bit temperature, of course, it contains much information. And uh, apart from the standard information, it, it just so that, uh, let me make, uh, <laughs> well, not um, uh, some uh, non-standard hypothesis. We, of course, we extract from, from this picture uh, much information about the, about the, um, um, about the spectrum, about the, uh, about this, it's Gaussianity, the Gaussianity. By to that, that way, I, I should say that what Professor Penrose um, said yesterday about this concentric things is not confirmed. Actually, I myself considered, um, and uh, other people considered a, a, a possibility that um, some uh, the general. Uh, um, Possibility, which is not ex excluded, but see, this see in big picture contains uh, some hidden information which we which we cannot uh, extract. And this, in fact, it reminds me. Uh, I think you all uh, read the um, uh, book by uh, Sagan Contact, and he in the uh, in his uh, the last chapters he. Uh, he proposed a hypothesis that if our universe is created by some master, it may contain some master's signature. And so in principle, so uh, uh, he had some com completely different I I idea about the signature. Uh, but uh, I would say, speaking in our case, uh, it's not excluded that really this picture of cosmic microwave background temperature has some hidden hidden signature but once more it's not that it's not that of concentric concentric things in fact it was investigated by a number of people if there, there is a, some uh, some part if some part of c in b temperature has excel excel symmetry with with respect to some excess and this excess was even even called excess of evil. I, I I don't know know why 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 evil. Okay, but, but the statement is we look for um, this uh, hidden uh, signature. So maybe it's time to move. Sorry, one more. Yeah. My, uh, okay. Let me. Uh, only very, very it's, it's not it's not excluded that uh, the cosmic micro background uh, keeps much more information. Yeah, I, uh, I predicted that, and that there is a quantum here in inflationary Hubble patch. In in once you resolve it as a quantum state, and that hair uh, is physical, it's observable. It's a quantum hair. It's not, not not any worse than any other classical information that you can you can have. So I mean, it's a 
it's it's the, the rest is a matter of uh, technology how you want to read it out okay gia and alex say there are other people who wanted to ask questions yeah yeah okay so let me move on to arupam you've wanted i've cut you off several times but you have to unmute yourself no, no, sorry. No, no, that's okay. That's fine. I, I think we, I discussed already. So, um, so I wanted to ask uh, Gia this problem about that um, S matrix formulation in the, in the cosmological context because he, he he has done quite a lot of work and spoken about it as well. So, Gia, could you elaborate it a little bit? I mean, how? I mean, I'm I'm just thinking from the from the picture of like uh, uh, from the world. I mean, okay. How should I say? Like, let's let's take a picture of, from the world line perspective. So let's say that, I mean, maybe I have some kind of like various universe in quantum cosmology perspective, but I have some, view, some of the world line uh, interpretation that I want to see that how I can build the S matrix form say into out states and maybe my universe is somewhere in between. Maybe you okay. have some insight in that. Okay, so uh, Robert, please. Because I don't want to take uh, too much time of this discussion, okay? Uh, um, yeah, just give a brief answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to give a brief answer, but if you think that I'm, I'm going overboard, just, just, shut, just shut me. Just, shut just, just mute me. Okay. Uh, so so the, the way, so, okay, the answer, of course, needs a more detailed discussion, but uh, it's, a, it's a, of course, it's a very important question. Thanks for asking this question. And so the, now the S matrix formulation can give you different, di different level of understanding. Uh, there are different layers, right? So the, the, the first message that I'm extracting from S matrix formulation is that because I see that it cannot be a vacuum, it has to be an excited state constructed on top of a valid S matrix vacuum. So that's already is a very important piece of information. So now, now in this way, as I said, I brought this analogy with Z boson, right? So Z boson is an excited state. It's, it's, not a, it's not an asymptotic S matrix state because it's not stable. So we can produce Z boson, let's say in E plus E minus collision, we can produce it, it lives for some time, then it decays. Uh, so now the, the, the nevertheless, already the information that we have, that Z boson is an excited resonance on top of a valid S matrix vacuum, gives me a right to study decay of a Z boson. Forget how it was formed, take Z boson as an excited resonance state and, and then see what, how it evolves in time and how it decays, okay? So therefore, uh, in first approximation, this is what we should do about the sitter, right? So we understand now that it has to be an excited resonance on top of Minkowski. Let me for a moment not worry how to form the sitter in an S matrix process, okay? But take it as an excited resonance and see what happens to it. And then there would be next step in which you can ask a fully fledged question. You can ask this question, can I form a sitter-like state uh, in some imaginary, hugely complicated S matrix experiment. Of course, there is no civilization <laughs> in probably in our Hubble patch that can do that experiment. But as a, as a matter of principle, we can imagine that experiment. Also, Robert, uh, Robert's question was sort of related to it. And so what, if you do that preliminary studies, this has not been fully studied, but preliminary studies indicate something very interesting that for a decider with cosmological constant, that constant, such experiment is not possible. So this matches very nicely the fact that the sitter with, with constant cosmological constant is excluded. With a scalar degree of freedom, such experiment is possible, okay? But again, it puts a very interesting constraint on number of e-foldings. So there is, it looks like that the picture is fully consistent, this, this is matrix picture. So that would be my, my very brief answer. Okay, so maybe it's time to move on to something that doesn't involve uh, uh, S matrix foundation of quantum gravity. So a different question. So uh, I see Alexei and Luca. So maybe I'll call on Alexei. Oh, sure. Because Luca will be taking over the discussion anyway in a short while. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I'm not sure I'm about this matrix or whatever, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was asking um, whether we know theory where non-locality arises somehow not like integrating out massive modes. I would be wondering first to understand what exactly you mean when you 
when you say such kind of model, do you mean kind of high spin series where we get this integrating out massive modes? Yeah, or? yeah, for example, for example, I mean, as I said, this is a question from an outsider. Uh, so I should be forgiven because I, I uh, but as, as I just said, I simply use my intuition about, so my question, yeah, was that, uh, suppose I, I finally, we, I, we construct a theory which with these non-local four factors mm -hmm. that is consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> I, I would expect that this theory should be understandable as some kind of a effective theory that describes some infinite tower of some uh, degrees <clears throat> some resonances that have been integrated out again from the intuition coming from string theory sort of because in string theory if i if i naively integrate out all the all the string modes i will get some some effective four factors no you see um, but even in string theory mm -hmm. even in string theory like in string field theory for example you get this non-local form factors yes in vertices but this doesn't matter too much for the moment you get them explicitly not from higher modes. Higher modes contribute in some other way, but you just get them from correlation function of vertex operator of your yeah, 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 that's what I meant. I mean, I, what I meant no, here, yeah, This, is, this yeah. is exactly yeah. an example where you get them without higher mo high mass modes. Higher mass modes do some job, but and they do complicate the story, but fundamentally you get it uh, just from extended nature of the string. Well, but and this is related. Extended nature of the string is is intrinsically related with the fact that you have infinite tower of uh, string resonances. Uh, the two are uh, inseparable. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, having them, you can just cut them and put them all of them to zero. So you don't have to integrate them out somehow and bring them uh, in some non-perturbative effect like tachyon potential. Yes, you indeed integrate out all massive modes and this is what you exactly do in order to get tachyon potential, condensation to another vacuum. But it's not about locality or non-locality. This paper by Zwiebach and Sen about rolling tachyon. No, I understand, I understand. <clears throat> I understand, but, 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 but my question was not about string theory. In string theory, I understand how this, these things work, at least qualitatively. Um, and by the way, in string theory, because of, because of this closed open correspondence, uh, even if I go in far infrared, I can think of it as contributions from the, for example, the simplest thing when, when the open string loop looks the same as the three level exchange of a closed string that already tells me that the information is encoded about an infinite tower. Yeah, this is correct. Time. I'm just saying that you don't have to obligatory. You will have yeah, the yeah, same effect. But my the question was not very clear. It was very intuitive, uh, hand wavy question. I, I had nothing concrete in mind, but uh, the only thing I know is that if I artificially, I, I can mimic certain form factors by integrating out degrees of freedom, uh, tower of degrees of freedom, not necessarily heavy. They could be also light or even massless. I mean, that's uh, uh, so. Yeah, yeah I would say that the deepest, most interesting kind of non-locality come from integrating out massless degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. You integrate out a massive degree of freedom, then at low energies, it's it could yes, be I agree, I agree, I agree. a series in derivative. Uh, I agree. I agree. So I didn't mean I didn't mean necessarily massive degrees of freedom. Some tower of degrees of freedom. That's what I meant. In, in other words, my question was whether there is always a dictionary between non-locality and infinite, infinite. Uh, uh, let me call it tower. Infinite number of degrees of freedom. I think that there is actually. In, um, I think that the truly speaking, these theories are valid only in the world sheet level, and we are just taking the world line limit of the world sheet theory and trying to mimic it as much as possible. So I think what uh, Richard says, uh, um, I, I absolutely agree with were some of the points that you cannot just treat, you cannot just take infinite derivative field theory and claim that it's super renormalizable and renormalizable. Those things really do not make sense. They are at best, they are just the tool to simplify your life where you cannot solve many of the problems in uh, string scatterings and things like that, just to get some intuition about the UV behavior and that's it. But I think people have taken it uh, to a, huge extent that claiming that these are super renormalizable and blah, blah, blah. But I think uh, this is my simple understanding. Richard, maybe you wanted to say something and then we go on to some, someone else. Uh, I, I didn't have anything in particular to say. What did you want said? No, I, so, I just wanted to give you the yeah. chance to add something if you wanted to. So uh, your answer would be yes. No, I, I'm, I'm happy with the discussion. Okay. Okay. My, my answer to what is yes. So you would say yes. 
to, to what? To the, this fact that uh, effectively non-local non, non form factors can be mapped on integrating out some degrees of freedom. Uh, or no, I don't know, that was the question. Uh, I don't think I would always agree to that, no. Um, I, I can cook okay. examples both way. The ones that Alexei uh, asked about uh, occur in nature, uh, I think always can of course be um, uh, related to uh, uh, to um, integrating out degrees of freedom. For example, if if you all recall that uh, QED model that I discussed, where uh, I considered what would happen to vacuum yeah, polarization if the electron mass went to zero, that's a non-local. Uh, uh, this case is most interesting. That's very interesting because if you are saying that there could be an example where I can have intrinsic non-local form factor that is not reducible to degrees of freedom that's very interesting i would i would think that would be very interesting uh, yes this would be indeed very interesting <clears throat> the question is uh, that maybe these are just two effective formulations of all the same and uh, your question maybe what would be the fundamental point from which you start to quantize for example this is right. another problem but i yes i tend to agree that the uh, Anyway, usually we made this uh, high derivative such that you can map to something, whether it's yeah. realistic or not, it's another question. Uh, for the time being, um, yeah. Well, at least what we observe in gravity, um, this was obtained like uh, just play of uh, geometrical quantities. We didn't require any strings or whatever, but uh, most likely you are right. We can construct some effective model where all the same will be mimicked by higher towers of masses uh, and maybe this can help in doing something but uh, it's maybe it definitely not so straightforward it's not like one step procedure for sure yeah thank you uh, luca you wanted to yes yeah, okay yeah my answer uh, is not related to the last uh, part of the discussion but it's anyway about uh say high derivative so um I would say that in the, since the workshop started, we had Richard Wood that was very critic against uh, high derivative uh, theories. Okay, so how to make sense of the ghosts in high derivative theories in a consistent way. Okay, but what uh, uh, I'm also curious about one of his statements in his talk that was like, in my opinion, the fundamental theory is general relativity. Okay, so my question is just it's not just to Woodard but also to any of us. Okay, we usually when we Working field theory, we have uh, this uh, Wilsonian approach that we need to add some uh, hard uh, degree of freedom, okay, to complete the theory. Like for instance, in Einstein gravity, what we do, we add R square and Y square, so more degrees of freedom. We try to make the theory normalizable, okay. But the question is, it may be that maybe we should really change our way to think, okay. Maybe for gravity, we should use a new kind of paradigm where. Uh, this Wilsonian approach doesn't make sense, and maybe the fundamental theory can be really just general relativity, which is a two derivative theory uh, of uh, gravity. And uh, so the question is for everyone, but it's especially to Richard, who mentioned in his talk, like, uh, in my opinion, fundamental theory is general relativity, which is basically. No, actually, well, I'm sorry Richard, for misleading. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, yes. sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Luca is saying, uh, actually, in your talk, you said the fundamental theory must be local. So I think that's what. Uh, uh, no, no, I remember was a general relativity, right? Well, let's let's oh, yeah, I, I, I said general relativity, but I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean anything other than that. That that's what I was doing. Uh, that is the calculations that I was doing were in the context of using general relativity as the fundamental theory in the sense of low energy effective field theory. That's all. I see. So uh, anyway, the question still remains, let's say. Un un unlike a lot of people here, I am going to be honest with you. I honestly don't know how gravity achieves its ultraviolet uh, completion. I think it's at least possible that it makes sense non-perturbatively. That is that it, it um, uh, either through the classicalization technique that um, um, he is talking about or uh, through uh, the cancellation of ultraviolet divergences that uh, Deser and um, Arnowit and Misner uh, pioneered back, it, it showed existed in uh, classical gravity and in, in, uh, that, that it cancels its own divergences. But I honestly don't know. No, yes, because I mean, I would, I mean, if we compare 
gravitation interaction, we do interaction. Okay, what happens is that if we go at Planck scale, we really have a different topology when we speak about quantum gravity because we have black hole production. Okay, so why we need to stick to really? By, by the way, I'd, I'd like to perhaps modify your question a little bit and pose it to uh, Gia. Uh, and that is, uh, let me, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the classicalization idea, but um, does it, uh, you've been arguing that it applies uh, uh, in scattering of graviton, uh, physical graviton amplitudes and physical particle amplitudes, does it apply as well to uh, loop corrections? That is, do virtual gravitons achieve the same thing? Well, th that's a fantastic question. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to know the answer to the question. And uh, absolutely, yeah, that's precisely uh, the, the one of the uh, questions about this uh, classicalization, because uh, th this fact that in deep UV, uh, Einstein gravity, or it, or the string, its string theoretic embedding, are classicalizing through black holes, is more or less um, clear. So, I mean, of course, technically you have to compute a lot of things, but uh, we, the principle uh, we are, we understand. We understand what is happening is that there is a there is a, a very strong softening of of amplitudes. And if you try to scatter two very hard gravitons, the result that you get are you get many soft ones. Now the question that you are asking, of course, is what happens in the loops? Okay, so the gravitons that they they, they run in the loops, uh, they uh, once their masses, uh, uh, virtual <laughs> masses, exceed uh, Planck scale, uh, should can we still treat them as, uh, as 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 particles, or something should happen there? And uh, I think the answer is something should happen there. The question is, what is the right technique to, to, to how to compute this, okay? And um, I think even there, classicalization can help. Uh, certainly, string theory helps a lot because string theory uh, has this, um, uh, it takes over at some scale, which is lower than Planck scale. And so in string theory, uh, loop, uh, perturbative string theory works. But here, the question is non-perturbative. That's right. So string theory would make it finite so that it could be explicitly studied. And I might be free to view that just as a regularization rather than as a fundamental theory. But if classicalization works for loop amplitudes, that could be the answer for us without any other extra baggage. No, no, sure, sure. Absolutely. But they, they could be absolutely. That, that's, that's precisely the point. So, so uh, however, there is one caveat, even, even in case of uh, string theory, uh, we know that the, 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 the usually we there is typical this asymptotic behavior, right? That when the number of uh, diagrams increases factorially, because number of diagrams increases factorially, no no matter how weak is the coupling, uh, sooner or later the, the 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 perturbative expansion of the of the loop diagrams uh, breaks down, and we have to enter into high high non perturbative techniques like resurgence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think classicalization can also help there, because uh, this this breakdown of acid, the perturbation theory and loop expansion, in reality, is because uh, these loop diagrams they start to account for non non perturbative states, and and so that's what happens. And these non perturbative states are multi particle states, and uh, so yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I fully agree with your question, and um, I, I, I'm I'm thinking the almost nonstop precisely about that. Um, I mean, I think that there is there is a something very interesting that classicalization can can tell about computation of gravitational loop amplitudes. Right? Sorry, loop, gravitational loops. Yeah. A, so there's no it's question a very that discussion, there, but there are other people who wanted to uh, chime in. For example, Masahide. You have your you have your hand up. Ah, yes, thank you. So, yeah, uh, my question might be related to the classical relation. So, in many talks and uh, actually in cosmological perturbation, when we try to quantize gravity, first we perturb metric around the classical background, then we quantize the uh, perturbation. But of of course, probably full quantum gravity. In full quantum gravity, background should be also quantized. So does non-local theory help to quantize uh, background geometry too? You see, if we regard the uh, full metric as an operator, 
probably we can quantize、uh, full metric as it is. But、uh, without making how to, how to say, we, yeah, that non local theory helped to、uh, fully quantize. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by、uh, quantizing the background? I'm not sure I understand that.、Uh, just, I, I,、uh, just I'm asking that.、Uh, in full quantum gravity. But, but I don't know、so、what you mean by. Yeah, no, no, maybe I can, just, I can clarify that. So when we do a theory of cosmological perturbations, we assume that there's a classical background. Yes. And Basahida is asking shouldn't we replace this classical background by something quantum? And if we、yeah. do that, would that help? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from, from my, my, because you mentioned classicalization, from my perspective, the answer is、yeah. precisely yes. That's my approach. In other words, my approach is that、uh, first I, I take S matrix. S matrix tells me that there is only one true, true vacuum, that's Minkowski, and everything else that normally I would think of it as a background, now I should be understood as, a, as, a, as an excited、uh, multi graviton state constructed、mm -hmm. on that background. So, from that point of view, it's like if you are doing physics, let's say, in the background of gravitational wave, there it's easy to swallow because we understand gravitational wave is a bunch of gravitons. Uh, but uh, there is one step from there. I'm saying we also have to accept the same similar treatment for other backgrounds. So, that, that would be my answer.、Mm. So, so, do you think that uh, uh, is it possible to define graviton without a background? Yeah, in the S matrix approach, graviton is defined as, a, as an asymptotic state or S matrix, S -matrix asymptotic state. I asymptotic see. I see. Of the Minkowski vacuum. And that's why you no longer have to worry about other backgrounds. So, this, this, in other words, you see, my approach is, 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 is sort of, I'm, I'm simplifying my life enormously because what I'm saying, I'm saying, S matrix theory tells me that there is only one true, well, there is one true vacuum, Minkowski. Okay, let me put the ABS aside because ABS is equally good. So, Minkowski, everything else,、uh, don't worry, everything else is made out of gravity. That's my approach. So, you, oh, the only thing I need to do to quantize gravity on Minkowski, I,、uh, okay, and okay, I know how to do it, string, string theory, low energy limit, I can take low energy limit of string theory, I know what I get. And then everything else I'm viewing as a, as a composite object co or,、uh, const constructed out of gravity. Of course, technically, some of the objects can be extremely difficult to, to compose, obviously,、mm -hmm. but that's a technical issue. That's not a conceptual issue. So, that, that's, that's my approach. So, it sort of, over, it sort of simplifies my, my life enormously. But,、uh, okay, I like to, be, to, to simplify my life. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, may I add okay, something? At this point, let me hand, before you speak, Gerard, let me hand over、uh, the chain of the discussion. To Luca, because I have to sign off because I'm hosting a colloquium at McGill. So, I'd, 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 I'd like to thank for,、uh, Luca and Shravan for、uh, all their work, staying up every, every day until five o'clock in the morning or later. So, thank you very much, and please continue to have、uh, the discussion and let me know what happened. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Robert, thank you. We will keep you updated. <laughs> I was just about to. Uh, thank you. I was just about to, to, in, to uh, interrupt. Uh, I think it's a very good idea that we should be splitting the problem of quantizing gravity into small units. And there are some questions, most of these questions are extremely hard to answer. I realize that. The one question which is slightly easier to answer is how classicalization works from my point of view. So I, I have a view of quantum mechanics being actually a consequence of certain. Chaotic behavior, which I can quantify. I can put that into closed equations. And、um, I can show that very many systems, which at some level become very fast moving, fast oscillating, and in very tiny locations, so, so that they are forced to get very high energies, those systems you can attribute to the power of, of somehow generating quantum mechanics out of thin air, actually. And I can explain that more, but there's not much time for that. The much harder questions, which I also saw come passing by here, are well, how, how to handle non locality. And my question there is and I just want to pose that here as well you do want to recover, in to, to some extent at least,、uh, local Lorentz invariance. And if you make the space like components 
higher dimensional, higher derivatives, but not in the time-like direction, then you're bound to violate Lorentz invariance. Of course, I would add to that. And the question is, how do you think of restoring in the same time Lorentz invariance? Now, I understand this is a very hard question, but we should at least attempt to, uh, to solve these various different problems as far as we can. And so Lorentz invariance, it doesn't completely disappear on the general relativity, it modifies. You still have, of course, in standard general relativity, the non-quantum mechanical general relativity, you still have local Lorentz invariance. So Lorentz invariance doesn't die. Uh, in fact, it's very essential for the entire universe as well. But you have such a thing as Lorentz invariance, and certain locally, but we have to bring all these notions together and understand how somehow higher derivatives can modify gravity into something that we can handle mathematically much better than if there were no higher derivatives. We know all that, but um, we have to combine all these ideas together. It's going to be extremely difficult. But my question now explicitly is what about Lorentz invariance? There was a question if anyone wants to comment about Lorentz invariance. Well, yes, uh, if you, as soon as you write down higher derivatives in a space-like direction, but not in a time-like direction, then, of course, you have something that, which, to me, doesn't look like Lorentz invariance. Lorentz Maybe invariance are in, okay. in like dispersion to, relations, uh, which, which relate to the time-like derivative and the space-like derivative in such a way that, that only Lorentz invariance, uh, you know, the speed of light will be the same with every, every body, you know, that kind of thing. And there will be an absolute maximum to the speed of light of the speed of light to signals being transmitted. All these questions are related. And, and our problem is that we want to solve them all at the same time, which is going to be hell of a problem. I think there was Alexei uh, in order of uh, people who want to ask question. Please, Alexei, you can, you can ask, you can speak. Okay, I, I, I just, just, I, because I prefer concrete, concrete questions, I would uh, simply um, remind you uh, that we have a, a whole discussion and I think that we uh, have not come to uh, an agreement. It's a question, uh, it's a, it's a concrete, concrete question about the ghost um, due to the wild tensor squared. So, uh, I, so my my proposal is just to uh, return to this question. And I, so I, as I said in my talk, as I said in my talk, I don't think that it is it is viable. Uh, so I shifted I shifted to uh, the intuition of of high energies, so um, uh, but okay, it was it was who the thing that, that we can live with this ghost. I I propose uh, uh, that them to express their opinion even more. Mm -hmm. Anish. Yes, uh, so uh, I, I I just want wanted to um, um, bring a point that uh, that you look look uh, was saying, and and this uh, I mean with with respect to having a fundamental theory which can cure these these prob problems that we we were discussing, and and this uh, I I want to spe spe specify um, a particular experience from particle physics point of view, so this uh, problem of having. Um, um, or giving the mass to a gauge boson in a gauge invariant manner has, has been there for a long time and people start tried this to stuffical back mechanism then we had the x mechanism that proven but uh, there was a part particular model done by nambu yona las 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 you know, where they had that the fundamental degrees of freedom are fermionic in nature everything else every all other bosonic degrees of freedom spin 2 spin 1 spin 0 are derived from these fundamental fermionic degrees of freedom. So maybe uh, to just just to bring in a new point to uh, or a new pers perspective to your point, Luca. 
So, so if we can have a fundamental theory which only consists of fermionic degrees of freedom, and then rest of this uh, point, I mean, rest rest of the um, states, the graviton or are, can be induced from this fermionic degrees of freedom, then we can have uh, maybe a better way to un understand this this kind of scenario. So, just just to bring in a new uh, perspective from part, part particle physics point point of view. Sure. Well, let me just say one thing that about the standard model. People have been thinking, as, as you said, Namurio and Alazino have been thinking about that by saying by replacing fields by, to in fermions. Mm -hmm. The standard model showed us that's not the right way. The right way is to introduce scalar fields and fermions and vectors. And that was the only way to get asymptotic freedom, for instance, so that your theory is well behaved in the far ultraviolet. Not infinitely well behaved, unfortunately, but, but so well behaved that we can do very interesting calculations. But um, again, here uh, I notice then that people are seeking for answers, but the answers are too far away from the real world that we know. The real world that we know has all these three fields, but in addition also spin two fields and probably then also spin three half in, in the Gravitino sector. So, um, but well, that's going to be the ultimate answer to everything. Or again, that whole picture of a finite number of particles is again only an approximation. String theorists think they know better or good for them. Perhaps they're right, perhaps not. And I just want to be a bit careful with this string theory answer. But in, in general, we want to have a picture of physical degrees of freedom. Even string theory, uh, just because what uh, exactly what, what the GL was saying, that string theory is typically an S matrix theory, but that's also a defect. That's a, a, a very bad quality of the theory that you can't understand what happens off shell. And if you really want to understand the physical world, you have to understand what happens off shell as well. And uh, again, that's one of these small questions that we can ask, but um, uh, we have to put it all together. Yes, so, so yeah, sure. Thanks, and thanks for your point. So, so, so my my small point was that maybe uh, I mean, um, if not necessarily derive all the um, all the bosons from the fermions. What I mean, my point was that the fermionic degrees of freedom does not have these issues that that we are generally dis dis discussing. So, so these issues of di divergences and this point of view are not 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 necessarily associated uh, to the fermionic degrees of freedom. So in some way, if not necessarily deriving all the bosonic degrees of freedom from fermionic degrees of freedom, but if if we have a way to uh, cure these uh, uh, problems of uh, quantum gravity through fermionic degrees of freedom, then we might have possible some di more di direction. That so that that's the my only curiosity. Well, again, I would say comp reality might be a bit more complex because if you have only fermions and nothing else, it's very hard to make them interact at all. If you interact them, you have a four Fermi interaction, and that's of course highly non-renormalizable. So, um, so you also attacked problems that might not be necessary. So, no, 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 but but the but smoothest very... theories of nature are the ones which have where you have both spinners and scalars and 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 as well as vectors. That works yeah. best. Yeah, it's true, but uh, but since we are discussing higher derivative the theory, so the four fermion contact uh, interaction with your ceiling is non non renormalizable from the point of view of two two derivative theory theory. If if, if I'm correct, so if yeah, I am um, then is lower, is lower as invariance, so that that's then a, a grave difficulty. Maybe let's uh, move to other people. So I, I would say that uh, let's. Uh, 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 let uh, Philip and Alex uh, to ask uh, or make some comment, and then maybe we can close officially uh, discussion because many people are leaving already. But of course, we can uh, still uh, be here for some time later. Okay, so yeah, how to conclude as well. So yeah, I, I need to yes. Yes. So, request uh, to stay for the conclusion remarks, yes, sure, please. Sir. Yeah. So please, Philip, it's your turn. Thank you for asking me to speak again. I've been listening to the conversation and I feel like I could raise two hands, but the, <laughs> but the system allows me to raise one. Um, I wanted to go back to Luca's uh, original question and Anisha raised something very relevant. Um, we have to ask what we're trying to do uh, in, in understanding quantum gravity. 
do we have to modify quantum mechanics in some way? Do we have to modify gravity in some way? Do we have to increase the number of space-time dimensions? Do we have to introduce supersymmetry? Um, or are we trying to do something more limited? And the limited, uh, the limited objective is not to come back to the Einstein equations at low energy. All that nature requires is that you come back to the Einstein solutions. You don't have to get the equations. If you get the equations, of course, you get the solutions as well. So uh, that's what I've been doing is working on these, working on theories and trying to use them to fit data, not to um, meet some pre-required pre uh, objective of achieving some specific uh, low energy limit. Now, the other issue that was raised, and I raised this a couple of days ago with the form fact approach, is there's no compelling principle which would tell you which one to use. Now, I agree, I agree, totally agree. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing because right now everybody's experimenting with trying to find which one will work. And maybe when we find which one will work, then we'll suddenly realize that there was a principle underneath it, uh, which would be remarkable. Um, but there are various principles and coming back to what Gia said, um, I don't think that the natural vacuum has to be Minkowski, uh, sorry, the natural background. The natural background has to be conformal to flat, not necessarily flat itself. And that of course, uh, what I've been doing is I'm looking for a principle which would restrict the theory. And of course, I, you, you, I've used conformal invariance and that gets me to conformal gravity. And that's why I think the background only needs to be conformal to flat and not, not Minkowski flat. But, um, and that's what I work on, only, mainly because it gives, there's a principle which is very, very restrictive. Uh, now, Anish raised the issue of Nambuyona Lucinio. Now, what Nambuyona Lucinio do is they don't, they don't generate gauge bosons. What they do is they generate a Goldstone boson. And I myself looked at that more recently and they also generate a Higgs boson. Now, as it stands, the four Fermi theory is not renormalizable. However, if you have anomalous dimensions, uh, you can bring the dimension of psi bar psi down from, four to, from three to two, and then psi bar psi squared is renormalizable. And that's the case that I, I've been looking at. And then you find that there is a dynamical Higgs boson, which um, I, I mean, to me, one of the key questions, and I think Harad is, is, is hinting, hinting at this, since we've discovered the Higgs boson, the big question for it is, is it elementary or is it composite? And, and I think we should really not just say, oh, it's elementary, some, uh, somehow there's a double well potential and it goes into the fundamental theory right from the word go. Uh, I think Nambuyon Lucinio is, is a warning that we should not proceed that way, but of course we have to work out all options. Um, so I, I mean, I'm sort of telling you my, my, my own thinking, um, but I think that there are some, some very, very uh, general questions that, that we have to ask about what, will, what we actually want to achieve, not just uh, how 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 do how do things work out? So anyway, that's my <laughs> that's my comment. Thank you. But Philip, uh, the idea that um, the Higgs mechanism should be form uh, the Higgs particle should be composite that has been around all the time, and people were too easily thinking that this is the way to go because after all, the proton and neutron also turned out to be composite. They are made of quarks, and let's go on along that that route. And people tried everything they had in, in their, to their ability to make such models work. And then whatever they did, it did not work. And what does the LHC not tell us? Forget it. It looks as if a single scalar with nothing around it works much better than, than most of us believe. I didn't expect the Higgs mechanism with a single scalar to work that well. I expected also more Higgs particles around. But nothing like that happened. It really looks like a pure scalar field, which is a very remarkable thing. Uh, that, that's a, a very remarkable, an unexpected fact that the LHC gave us. And I think it's a warning to theoreticians, like don't think too easily that you can modify the theories that work. Replace them by theories that you don't know yet know how to work, but somehow the difficulties will sort themselves out. 
as soon as you think the difficulties will sort themselves out, they don't. And, uh, and the original idea that that was the only model which didn't have those difficulties is more powerful for that reason than some of us may expect. So maybe we have to live with perturbative, uh, well, the standard model as a perturbative field theory and add to that perturbative gravity. And I've always advocated that's the theory that works, except that at the Planck scale itself, perturbative gravity is definitely no good. So we know that there are limitations to such a theory, but let's investigate how well it works and where it fails. And what can you do in a sort of minimalist, minimalistic way to sort out, to replace the theory with something better as minimally as possible? And where does that bring you? And I think I tried that for black holes and I think the result that, that I have found is, is extremely interesting, but not yet accepted by many people. But um, uh, it's all a, re all a result of being actually as conservative as possible. But don't be afraid to make gigantic steps every now and then, but also don't be afraid of stepping backwards and saying that step was no good. Uh, we tried it, we, we now see why it's failing. So we are going back to where we were before. And that's, uh, that's a more courageous step that we, we as theoreticians should make every now and then, uh, saying that the, although the idea you're working on looks as a marvelous improvement on what they had in the past, besides these few difficulties, well, watch out those few difficulties. They're going to be very serious. So the thing I said about Lorentz invariance, I think is therefore a serious question. We don't want to lose Lorentz covariance completely. It works extremely well if we surround a particle by a vacuum, then the only states well, that you have there are the states and the Lorentz transformations and uh, the Lorentz group just works perfectly. So don't forget that. And if whenever you add high derivatives in a space-like direction, but not in a time-like direction, just ask that question. What about Lorentz invariance? <laughs> Gerald, I completely, I, I completely, I could not resist uh, not to say this. And I completely agree with everything you said. So absolutely, yeah, I think that- Every uh, now and then we agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, in fact, this is the occasion when, when I fully agree, uh, because uh, I think we should uh, also look for a new, try to see if we understood everything in the old theory. Before jumping into changing a theory, let's see if we understood all the effects in the existing theory. And by the way, classicalization is precisely that. I'm trying to say that there are multi-particle effects that come from the old theory and let's try to understand those effects so it, it's along those lines exactly so i mean i uh, that, that's part of it so it's like understanding non-perturbative multi-particle states in in old theory without changing it well just a few days ago i sent a paper to the archive where i explain how this how the equations work when you want to want to generate the schrodinger equation out of a non-quantum mechanical theory and you can uh, now i understand how to do that and uh, I'm not sure about others. I see other people doing something similar, but I think they haven't caught some very important ideas, which uh, has to do with um, entanglement of the uh, very highest of the fastest moving particles in this universe. They, they get entangled in their fast movement. This you have to understand much better than I do now, but uh, I, th I think there's progress to be made here. Yeah, just to jump in, you, you, what you get is actually a coherent state, not really a purely a classical system. It's still, the quantum uh, is there in some sense. Uh, uh, yes, quantum, as as I explained in the paper, quantum mechanics is used as a quantum mechanics is used as a tool, not as a theory. It's just a way to handle completely classically evolving things, but they differ from the from the thing classical theories are used to, in the sense that they also contain discrete variables. So uh, you have real numbers, but also discrete numbers, yeah, flip-flops. The fermions are just things which do this all the time. And, uh, uh, and, and the bosons are more in a continuum, but even they uh, have some, in some sense, uh, discreteness in them. So it's like having field theory on a lattice. So, and, and this yeah, yeah, now, now you are changing the subject from what I understood. Because your previous comment was about standard model plus gravity yes, and to yes, try to now you are doing a completely revolutionary step. You are now yeah, now it's well, 
Yes, I'm. I'm, you are, I'm now you're doing precisely what you told us not to do, no? <laughs> well, no, no. I was explaining that you you are talking about classicalization. I'm not sure I understand what it means, but for me, it means something very concrete, which of which I can write down the equations. And now you can ask, do these equations make any sense? Can I use them or not? Well, okay. No, I understand. Yeah. Needs to be seen. Okay, maybe we can I, see also with uh, uh, Alex Wickman. Can I? Um, I want to go back to. No, for us, uh, no problem. We can stay. I mean, I don't know if some people want to go, so that's why I'm trying to rush a bit. Uh, for me, no problem. I, I just wanted to to go back to something Harad said a moment ago. The issue of the status of the Higgs boson and has puzzled me a great deal because the standard model really does work well, and I know that. However, if I start out with a full Fermi theory, I can introduce a dummy variable by doing a path interval over a scalar. And that scalar, it would be the Higgs, except for one thing, it doesn't have a source. There's no J sigma term in the action. That means it only appears as intermediate states in Feynman diagrams, namely all the four Fermi graphs that you could write, you could recover them by breaking them up into scalar field exchanges. But the scalar field, that one cannot go on shell because it's not a real field. But the you, could one, the way, you could say this way that the scalar field has no kinetic term from your point of view. As yes. soon as you add a kinetic term the Lagrangian for the scalar field, then it becomes a separate particle. Well, so on. do you want that or do you not want that? And the tendency of people is say, let's throw away the scalar field. In gravity, we are now doing the opposite. We add a, a kinematic term, a, a while square uh, action, term in the action, uh, which is the same thing same metamorphosis that the standard model underwent in the 1970s. Before that, we only had the four Fermi interaction. And we were, we were being, uh, well, uh, trying to figure out how, what to do with the non-renormalizability of the theory. Then you would say, well, wait, wait a minute, this, this interaction could have happened by the exchange of a scalar, or in the case of the weak interactions, the exchange of a vector. And then the discovery was the young Mills theory has to be added, which is the kinetic term for the vector field had to be added. And now you get the standard model. So that on hindsight turned out to be, have been the correct path uh, for, for history to go. Well, we went in a very uh, jittery path, but we got there. We have the standard model now. The standard model now again is only, only a one stop further, but we are not there yet. So the question is what now? Alex, speak one, please. Uh, I'm actually very happy that uh, Mislav raised the hand as well, so that I don't need to be the last one uh, raising hand in this conference. Uh, I, I have actually a kind of technical question, which is related to what you, Luca, was asking, and it's actually directly re related to what Professor Toft was saying now. Uh, and I think also Philip uh, would be interested a lot, so uh, Professor Mannheim. Uh, I think it's a kind of a very interesting situation because uh, if we would like to abuse uh, old Astrogradsky uh, instability uh, in the normal way, then uh, we would need to have these ghosts as degrees of freedom. Uh, however, we know that the proper path integral would be actually a Hamiltonian path integral, uh, and then we would need to write a measure for the momentum of this, uh, so to say, uh, auxiliary degree of freedom or whatever, ghosted degree of freedom, and also for the, for the not only for the momentum, but for them themselves. And that would make, of course, the theory extremely, extremely ugly. Because if you start, for example, from gravity with, let's say, wild squared term, then in our measure, it's not only like differentiation over all configurations of the metric. We would actually need to add all other guys which are hidden there. And the question is, what, what to do with them? Because the, the real construction of path integral uh, is not Lorentz invariant, right? Uh, but when we start getting rid of them to get only the measure D, let's say, Jimmy New in some sense, that would uh, create probably many other terms if we start from normal action for a while. It, does anybody know what is the situation there? How to basically think even about that? Thanks a lot. Could you clarify? I'm not sure I understand uh, the issue that you're asking. Uh, should, uh, okay. Uh, to clarify, it's very easy. So basically, uh, there, 
two ways how do we know about degrees of freedom if we do pass integral. So one way is through the number of derivatives and equations of motion. And another way is through measure in the pass integral. And of course, we kind of usually try to write normal pass integral in terms of the field which we see in the Lorentz invariant normal, normal action. Uh, let's say if you take uh, while square gravity with R square term and all these other guys, we would write measure D of a G menu, right? Of G menu. But in reality, because there are all these ghosts and hidden degrees of freedom, if we start from normal functional integrals, the one which reproduces unitarity, which reproduces real Schrodinger equation, it will be a mess. And not only that we can, usually we can integrate out momenta and stay help, like happy with uh, normal Lagrangian pass integral. But here there is also an additional part in the measure which corresponding to the field, uh, which is actually ghosts there. So I don't know what is what what how how, how to deal with what, it. What problem do you see with that? Uh, maybe maybe uh, um, maybe the issue is Euclidianization versus Minkowski signature. If it was Minkowski signature, it's all e to the i stuff. And then when you integrate out the uh, ghost, uh, let's see if I recall the canonical formalism has four. Um, uh, uh, canonical variables and you want to integrate out three of them and uh, uh, integrating out two of them, I think gives uh, functional delta functions, which just enforce um, a constraint on the, and then tell you how to integrate out the final one. Uh, what, what's the big deal? I mean, it, 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 as long as it's Minkowski, I, I think it's okay. Formally speaking, I mean, none of these measures exist in a strict mathematical sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. We're thinking of some Euclideanized version. And then, of course, e to the minus uh, xp doesn't give a delta function. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's kind of would be not allowed to go to Euclidean version because there is no positive positiveness of energy. And yeah. therefore, if you want to stuck to to proper, uh, because, of course, for field theory, it, it, it's much worse. But if you just do quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, there will be still instability. But formally speaking, at least it's not this completely crazy instability, which we don't know even how to how to deal with. But I don't understand the issue about the instability. Um, uh, I don't think precludes uh, integrating out the canonical measure to get to the um, uh, to the um, um, covariant or the seemingly covariant measure. Okay, I think this is more a technical issue, which can be discussed like on it is technical, later. Yes. Yeah. So I think let me be more uh, strict now because I'm too nice, I think. So let's just get the last two uh, official question or comments from Tomislav and Fabio. Then we make some closing remarks. Okay, but I mean, we will still be here. Okay, so please Tom, if you can be not, I mean, let's say quick, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm happy I'm not the last one, but also I wouldn't <laughs> mind. <laughs> I think I, I think also Fabio will not be the last one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think that's all just proves that this conference came at the right spot uh, in time and everybody really wants to discuss. But anyway, I just want to make a comment on what Gerard was earlier saying. I couldn't complete, I couldn't agree more with you that experiments beautifully confirm that Higgs is the right way to go. There is, however, a theoretical concern, and that theoretical concern is related to the fact that the standard model becomes unstable at about 10 to the 11 GB, right? And that is not an energy that is high enough uh, uh, to, well, to do everything we want to do uh, in cosmology. For example, if you like inflation, Inflation is typically at a high energy, right? So, but there is a there is a rather elegant way of uh, out of this problem. Uh, in other words, an, a rather elegant completion of uh, of the standard model by including the portal sectors, uh, and that's an additional scalar which possibly also has a gauge sector or even sometimes fermions, uh, which is the singlet under the standard model group, and moreover. Um, particular interesting models are conformal versions of this. And what it achieves, it A, stabilizes the standard model onto, plus this extension onto the Planck scale. B, provides a, a nice dark matter model. C, also um, 
provides a possible biogenesis mechanism. And what D is also, it is in principle testable uh, by, um, in two ways, A, at the next generation of accelerators, in particular, high luminosity LHC, and B, uh, by gravitational wave experiments, in particular, LISA detector, which will come online 2034, presumably, right? So, um, and uh, as I said, these models uh, are very simple, and also maybe my last comment, is uh, within these models, you can also, um, they work as long as there are no particles that are much heavier than the electroweak scale. So you can ask the question, what about the uh, neutrino sector? A neutrino sector can be embedded exactly in the same way so that the uh, Marana neutrinos gain, gain mass also at the electroweak scale without uh, much uh, fine tuning. And uh, so, uh, but of course, all of this uh, is great news because all of these ideas, A, they are consistent with current experiments, but also B, they're testable, let's say, I would say uh, in the next 20 or 30 years. So I think, uh, um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Thanks. Fabio. Uh, me, okay. I, I have a question for Gia. Um, I, I would like to ask uh, if uh, he has uh, some uh, explicit model for uh, classicalization in, in interactions different from gravity. Well, yeah, I mean, there are some to toy examples in which, um, I mean, again, it's, it's important to understand that uh, the, the, the technically, we are trying to compute what we can, obviously, right? Uh, so it may happen, for instance, that uh, you have a theory, in, in that theory, some amplitudes classicalize and some amplitudes do not. So that may happen, obviously. Um, yeah, so the, the, the amplitudes that, that w one thing that is, is sort of emerging is that the amplitudes that, if you have saturons in the theory, the, 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 the objects that saturate this, this entropy bound that I, 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 I gave in my talk, uh, where entropy is inverse optocoupling, then uh, for that kinematic regime that produces those, uh, at those energies, of the, when center of mass energy is equal to saturon energy, those amplitudes classicalize, okay? So that, that's the answer. So the answer is yes, yes, there are, there are plenty of, so, the classicalization is con connected with saturation. So whenever the system saturates, whenever a system gives you a saturated state, so the, the, the scattering amplitude always gives you a high occupation number soft, soft, uh, soft mode state. So the saturation. Okay. So I don't see any, any raised hands. So I think uh, we can maybe move on to the concluding remarks.